Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jason Von Metting, and I'm a researcher at the University of Florida. And I'm here with Darian Alexander Williams, my co host on a podcast called Disasters Deconstructed. We're so happy to be your host today um, and for this series of climate related discussions that will be occurring over the next few Fridays at lunchtime. We have some amazing guests coming on to speak to prominent issues related to climate change with a focus on the state of Florida. The point of the series is really to disseminate knowledge to inform decisions on how to move Florida forward with the best science. Thanks, Jason. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us. I'm Darian. I'm a researcher at MIT, originally from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, and as we get started, we want to thank the Florida Climate Institute for organizing this event, along with co-sponsors, the Florida Sea Grant and the UF Office of Sustainability. Our conversation today is about where we build past, current, and future mistakes. We have a long history of thinking about how to best build for protection against coastal threats, such as hurricanes, erosion, surge, uh, flooding, but we tend to overlook the critically important questions um, and discussions about where we build. Uh, so today, we consider how we seem to actually create risk through how we undertake development in Florida, and we have two very special guests joining us today for this conversation. Okay, so wherever you're watching this stream, we invite you to engage with our discussion today. We'll be monitoring the chat across platforms and bringing your questions in wherever we can. And I wanna begin by introducing Thomas Rupert. Thomas is an attorney who leads the Florida Sea Grant College Program's Coastal Planning Program. Through this program, he works with partners to develop legal and policy analysis for local governments on planning for sea level rise, community resilience, and associated long-term challenges and opportunities for Florida's coastal communities. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to speak with Gilbert Gall and all of you. And uh, we also have Gilbert Gall um, here with us today. Um, Gilbert Gall has twice won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, and for more than 35 years, he's worked as an investigative journalist for the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and other newspapers. He's written a book that will be discussed today, The Geography of Risk, Epic Storms, Rising Seas, and the Cost of America's Coast. Thank you for joining us, Gil. Well, thanks for having me. I think um, this is an important discussion, and I think um, let's have some fun. Okay, so before we hand over to Gil to share some critical insights into his book, um, I'd like to invite both of our guests to sort of locate this discussion for us in the Florida context. So why is it so important to talk about where we build in this state? So maybe in a few sentences, perhaps, Gil, you'd like to go first? <laughs> Sure, I'd be happy to go first. And uh, I'm just going to tell you up front that um, I, I don't intend to be subtle here today because I think the risk um, that we're talking about is huge and dramatic and incredibly expensive. Um, just a couple real quick facts that I jotted down. So the reason Florida is important, among other things, is that you have a trillion dollars worth of property along the immediate coast. And by that, I mean the oceanfront and the bays. And that's part of what I estimate is $3 tr trillion worth of property from Cape Cod to Corpus Christi. $145 billion of that $1 trillion in property in Florida is at three feet or less of elevation, which also happens to be the mid-range estimate um, for sea level rise by the end of this century. Zillow, the real estate company, which actually has a pretty good research arm to it, estimates that one out of every eight of those Florida homes is going to be underwater by the end of the century, by 2100. And by that, they're not talking about mortgages. They're talking literally about being underwater. Meanwhile, the air and the water um, in and around and above uh, Florida is getting warmer and is anticipated to get warmer. And that's just more fuel for the hurricanes of the future. And I'll end with this. Um, people keep coming. Florida population was 5 million, I think, in 1960. It's now above 22 million people, and they're building in all the wrong places. 
Thanks, Gil. Um, that's, that's a great start. And Thomas, what about you? Why is this conversation so important from your point of view? Well, Gil summed up a lot of the statistics, and I'm glad to leave those to him. I tend to be less of a numbers person and more, more of a concepts person. But for me, when I look at it from the big picture, history the it's the history of florida that makes this issue so important because as gill pointed out with the statistics yes we've built a lot but you have to understand that for over a century the entire history of florida has revolved around the idea of development and growth so this topic that so dramatically impacts that development and growth really goes to kind of the heart and soul of what florida has been all about for over a century um I think that's what makes this so critical. And I also know from my work in this area for over a decade now here in Florida that it this idea of talking about how we build versus where we build, yes, we've focused a lot on how we build and we've made great strides in that and we're continuing to make great strides in building stronger, more resilient structures. But I know from talking to people who have been involved in this field for many decades longer than I, that this has really been the elephant in the room for about half a century now that we cannot talk about where. And that has to change. And I know that people have been trying to change it for half a century. So I don't know that Gil and I are going to change it here today, but <laughs> everybody that can needs to get involved in this discussion to try to make that change. Thanks so much, Thomas. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite Gil um, to share some key takeaways from um, his <laughs> book, The Geography of Risk. And after that, we'll be having a discussion around four themes, risk mitigation, property rights and the cost of risk, broader development issues and the political nature of risk. And so as you listen to, to Gil share some insights about his book, we would love for you to put together some of your own thoughts um, and hear your questions around these themes in the comments. And we'll be monitoring those and addressing them as we as we can. OK, so Gil, over to you. Yeah. So I, I really like the way, Thomas, the way you just framed that. Um, I think that's exactly right. The question of how and where and, and they're very um, um, they're very different questions with very different responses. In my book, The Geography of Risk, I think I write that um, what we have done to the coast, not just Florida, but clearly Florida is a big piece of it, right? Um, what we've done to the, to, to the coast is one of the largest and um, cost, costliest planning mistakes in American history. And I, and I don't think that's um, an exaggeration um, at all, um, and we'll get into that as we go along, and I'll and I'll play that out. Um, I'm going to try to keep this short. I, um, I want to tell two quick stories, or one's an anecdote and one's a story, um, and then I'll go through a little bit of data and and maybe even ran a little bit to uh, to uh, to try to interject a little bit of um, humor and outrage into all this because there needs to be a little more outrage into this. Um, the first anecdote is is they, they both go to development and risk, which is the subject of my book and what I think of as hubris at the coast. But the first one is uh, I noticed in last December there, and I'm sure you all have read this by this point, but there was a, uh, a story in the papers about um, Jared Kushner and, and Ivanka Trump um, um, spending something like $31 million to buy a uh, two acre lot on the uh, uber swanky resort of Indian Creek Island down in North Miami. <clears throat> and when I saw this, my first reaction, having thought a lot about all of this stuff for the last four or five years is that, well, you know, that's not very surprising. The, the Trumps are, um, are taking over Florida the way the Bushes took over Texas. But then I thought to myself, well, Wait a second. You know, um, they're spending thirty-one million dollars for for two hundred feet of private waterfront on an island that's going to be underwater in the next two or three decades. And I mean, these guys like to present themselves as being very smart, but how is that a smart investment? The short answer is obviously that it's not a s smart investment. But I'll add a bit of context for for Floridians. Um, you've been undervaluing risk for decades and this is really just another example of how people undervalue risk and i will also add that um it's not just 
undervaluing the risk. It's it's that in a way it's kind of smart um, in in an odd and ironic way because they know that the federal government has their back and is likely to bail them out if something terrible like a Hurricane Michael or an Ivan or a Andrew or another storm hits them. Um, but still, in a way, that's not that's not really the point. The point is the message that they um, climate be damned and that they can can build where wherever they want. I think it's exactly that kind of arrogance that has fueled the reckless and rampant uh, development of America's coasts in recent decades, um, starting really in the post-war area in, in the 50s. And it's guaranteed, it's locked us into a cycle of ever costlier disasters now and into the future. And I'll give you some data on that in, in a few minutes. Let me um, go to the other to the other uh, short story. Um, so in 2017, as part of the book, I went um, I went down to uh, to Tampa. I visited Tampa because I had been reading a lot about Tampa, and I was I was fascinated by Tampa. As you know, it sits on this confluence of of a number of bays. It's part of the largest estuary, I believe, in the world. And you have Old Tampa Bay, which is this 12 mile relatively narrow, um, shallow funnel that ends at the doorstep uh, or the doorstep of the city. Um, and um, that's, um, that poses a terrific risk. But it's been a, it's been a hundred years since, since Tampa has been hit by a major hurricane, a Cat 3 hurricane or above. And during those hundred years since then, what's, what's developed um, is this really indifference and um, blasé attitude about hurricanes. People think who live in Tampa, which is now a uh, roaring development, um, the metropolitan area, they, they think they're hurricane proof. Even the mayor said that to me when I interviewed him. And yet Tampa is growing like a bad weed and, and, um, and it is just, um, just exposed. So after after um, in 2017, remember Hurricane Irma, right? Um, it um, for a while it looked like it was going to make a direct hit on Tampa. So for a hurricane, a major hurricane, to really whack Tampa, it has to do something a little bit unusual. Not every hurricane is, is going to do it. It's going to have to take a hard right hand turn up that bay. That doesn't happen very often. Most of the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, when they get in there, they're late season hurricanes. Um, they form at the bottom of the Gulf and then they roar up uh, often into the panhandle or to um, uh, Alabama or Mississippi or uh, Louisiana, sometimes Texas. Um, so, so that adds to this kind of growing sense of indifference there. And yet I asked the mayor, I said, well, you know, Irma flew by here. Um, you were predicting the end of the world. It didn't happen. But what would have happened if Irma had pushed all that water up old Tampa Bay into the city? Tampa has about five feet of elevation. That's about it. Um, and um, he looked at me and he said, well, where you and I are sitting, we would have had, we'd be sitting in 15 feet of water. So that kind of shows you the risk. And then what's exposed in Tampa in terms of potential damage going forward. And this is going to happen, by the way. It's coming. It's just a matter of time. It's just probability. Um, is uh, there's been a study uh, that was done by um, Curry Emanuel and at MIT in England, um, who is now at Princeton. They're both fabulous researchers on risk and hurricanes. And uh, they concluded that a Cat 3 or above storm coming up uh, Old Tampa Bay would cause between $175 billion um, and $250 billion in, um, in damage, one hurricane. And remember, the, the closest hurricane in history is Katrina, which was about $165 billion in adjusted inflation adjusted dollars. So you, you get a sense of, of what you're staring at. Miami is another place. I mean, Miami is just an accident, um, a tragic accident waiting to happen. Um, they, uh, the last major direct hit there was 26 when there was almost nothing there in Miami. That caused $100 million in damage. It, the storm went right through what was the downtown then. 
Uh, again, the estimates are that hurricane, a similar hurricane strikes Miami today, you're, you're staring at $250 billion in damage. Um, so those are just a couple of quick stories that I, that I think give you a, a sort of um, sense of what's at risk in Florida. Um, it's not just Florida, it's, it's the entire coast, as I said. Um, and um, the amount of money that we're staring at um, is, is dramatic. Um, let me just give you uh, a number from my book. Where did I go? Okay, so um, a couple things to, to be thinking about with, with, regard, with regard to risk in, in, in Florida and the rest of the coast is that the numbers are growing um, from disasters. Um, what we have seen in the last few decades should be really, really alarming to people. And yet it's not nearly as alarming as, as, as it should be. Um, what happens is you have a hurricane, it does all this damage. We're very sympathetic and empathetic to the people who suffer that damage. Um, and then we move right along and the money flows into re to rebuild the place that's been damaged. There's rarely any pause in the development game. There's rarely any attempt to sit back um, or to pause and to ask the bigger questions about what we're doing at, at the coast. So um, what's, what's happened is that over the last century, we've had um, monumental uh, catastrophic hurricanes um, throughout that period of time. Some, some periods are busier than, ever, um, than others, but, um, but we, we've had, we continue to have these hurricanes. But because in the past there wasn't nearly as much development as there is today, there wasn't that much damage. We didn't think that much about it. And we went ahead and we continued to build out these places because A, all the economic incentives are to develop the shorelines, not, not to keep them pure, to turn them into parks or places that the public can use. Um, it's to make money. We get that. And then there are all these vast or a vast array of federal subsidies that encourage development on both the front end and the back end. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about everything from grants for sewers and utilities to the Corps of Engineers pumping free sand in front of millionaires' homes on beaches that are eroding to my favorite, which is the National Federal uh, Flood Insurance Program, um, which is, among other things, ensuring um, about 1.5 million uh, vacation homes, second homes. So all of this helps to to turn our notions of, of risk on the head on on its head, and to encourage yet even more to development. We've socialized the risk at the coast. Um, that's what we've done. In 1955, federal government paid for about 5% of the cost of recovery after hurricanes. Today, the average is about 70%. And after certain hurricanes like Sandy, it was closer to 100%. So this is, I mean, this is just stunning. And it's not surprising that developers, builders, local mayors, um, folks who control land use would be incentivized to, to uh um, to, to just continue on developing. And then the result is that um, what we have seen is a gigantic uptick, uptick in costs and damages from hurricanes. Um, in the last two decades alone, right, since 2000, we have incurred 800, um, I'm sorry, we, we have uh, incurred, um, what is that number? 800, 800 billion to $1 trillion in damages. Um, coast or, coastal storms and hurricanes account for more damage than earthquakes, uh, wildfires, or, and tornadoes combined. So, um, I understand I'm sympathetic to the folks in California going through wildfire seasons and they appear to be getting worse as well, but the damages pale in comparison to, to, um, to a hurricane. And then the other thing we're seeing, and I'll, and I'll try to wind this down quickly, is that um, we have seen an, also an uptick in the largest, most catastrophic hurricanes um, during this, uh, these last two decades. Um, we call these uh, in statistics. We call these fat tails. These are these are the 
largest, most destructive hurricanes. And um, when we look at those of that 800 billion, uh, more than half of that uh, damage came from just five storms, Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. All those storms are since 2005, and three alone um, were in 2017. I will caution you that I'm, I'm, I, I approach this subject really, really conservatively. I'm not someone who believes that you can look at an individual hurricane and say, ah, oh, that's all climate change. But what I, what I do think is that you can look at these hurricanes and you can begin to see trends that, have, that are occurring that suggest that there is an uptick, an uptick and that climate change, particularly warmer air, warmer water, um, which is fuel for hurricanes, is leading to um, these more, bigger, more powerful storms. That's what the future is. That's why if I'm in Florida in particular, um, I would be um, scared in my wits if I own property there personally. Um, I would be looking to sell that property because what's coming down the pike um, isn't good. And the likelihood of you, if you view your house as an investment solely, um, as opposed to, you know, this is the place where I live and work and, it's, and that's why I'm here, um, you're going to be really sorely disappointed um, within the next few decades. Okay. Great. Um, thank you so much, Phil, for that an overview, for setting the stage, and for framing uh, for framing this discussion. And so, I, I want to start maybe a question to you. you. You bring up uh, these individual and collective notions of hubris um, and of believing in being hurricane proof. And I want to ask. Uh, does resilience or the idea of building up resiliency contribute uh, <laughs> a, a false sense of security? Like you build a flood wall. Sure. So you know, you, yeah. And, like when, when and, and, and you're, like, <laughs> oh, I'm ready. This is this is great. I, I love this question. Do, these interventions that maybe have bought time in the past, are they continuing to buy time? Or is it is it is it not happen, happening in that way? Well, I, I mean, I have lots of thoughts about, about resilience. Um, I'm not totally opposed to resilience. I used to be thinking that here's the federal government just spending billions and billions more dollars. Um, in this case, I mean, look at the irony, right? I mean, we're spending those billions of dollars to uh, correct the mistakes that we, we created in the past by spending more billions and billions or hundreds of billions of dollars over time to encourage development in the wrong places. Um, and yet that's that's what we've done. So in, from for a while there, I thought, eh, you know, I'm not a fan of resilience. And plus, I think it's, you know, there's a couple of questions. Define resilience. What do we mean by resilience? You know, what are we talking about when we talk about building sustainable coasts? Is there even, is, is there even such an animal? Florida is a 1,200 mile long peninsula, really? We're going to we're going to protect 1,200 miles. I don't think so. We don't we don't have the money to do something like that. So yeah, you can build an eight billion dollar seawall in in front of Miami, and you're going to keep out, um, which is being proposed. You're going to you're going to keep out some of the storm surge, um, and, th and that's not a bad thing. But what's going to happen behind the seawall? Right? What other things are going on? Florida's built on limestone. It's Swiss cheese. I mean, where the water just bubbles up even on sunny days, we call it sunny day flooding. People get people get stuck in their houses. Businesses have to shut down. And it's not just Miami, it's Charleston, it's a lot of places. It's happening here in the Northeast, in New Jersey where I live. So, um, you know, you're not gonna build a wall around, around Florida. We'll build selectively. There are places where we wanna save them because we need to save them. So eventually we're gonna build something to save lower Manhattan. I don't know if it's gonna be a hundred billion wall, which they were proposing at one point or a $60 billion wall. Um, we'll maybe build the wall in Charleston. I'm not sure, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, Charleston's a very special place for a lot of reasons. Very conflicted reasons, by the way, historically, as we know. Um, but it's a place that probably just for the history we might want to save. But are we going to save Dolphin Island? 
I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's, you know, most of the West end of Dolphin Island, that's all vacation homes. It's all second homes. It's all rental properties. I don't know about you, but I feel differently about saving a rental property than I feel about saving a house where somebody lives and works. I just do. I think it's a different moral uh, calculus um, and we need to think about that. So I don't know. I mean, I think we're going to move ahead with, with resiliency I, at the coast. I think we're going to spend um, gobsmacking amounts of money to try to save ourselves and try to protect things. I think it will buy us time, um, but I don't think it's going to solve the problem. I don't, I don't think it's going to come close to solving the problem. And I think in the long run, between the sea level rise, um, uh, between these bigger, more powerful storms, um, between the arrogance and the way we continue to build at the coast, I, I think we're going to continue to see a, a really expensive um, situation at the coast, a really um, catastrophic situation at the coast. Thanks, Gil. I, I want to come to you, Thomas, and we're, we're seeing some great questions coming in the comments, and we'll try to get to um, as many questions as we can. A lot of them are about um, finance and who pays for, for the construction of risk. Um, but I want to ask you about um, Sea Grant and where, where do public programs involve themselves in terms of risk mitigation? And what does the ideal future look like for them? And then from your point of view as an attorney, can you tell us a little bit about how the law fits into this question about building in dangerous places? And I saw this question from um, Adrienne uh, saying, when, when do we simply say you can't build here anymore? Wow, that's a lot of good questions uh, <laughs> yeah. that are that all have a lot of meat to them. But I actually wanted to start by following up just for a moment on what Gil said, because I've said a lot of the same things in slightly different wording for a long time. So I want to take this opportunity to reiterate them. And I think primary among that is it drives me crazy. One of the things that most drives me crazy is people talking about solutions when it comes to sea level rise. There is no solution to sea level rise. There is not a solution. We are not gonna stop the oceans from going up. So what we're really talking about is we're talking about adaptations. And those adaptations, as Gil pointed out, they're extremely expensive and they can buy time. So what we need to start thinking about is, yes, most places that are currently very low line and highly at risk, we are going to lose. Will there be exceptions? Yes, maybe we can save lower Manhattan. Maybe we can save parts of Miami. I don't know, that remains to be seen. If we start talking, it depends on what time span you're talking about. But ultimately, yes, what I see is that we most likely are going to continue to spend gobsmacking amounts of money, as you so eloquently put it there, Gilbert, uh, to buy more and more time. And to some degree, buying time is absolutely what we need to do at this point. But my fear is that rather than buy time to figure out better ways to move back in the future and create our real living spaces in safer areas, what we're gonna do is we're gonna buy more time and continue to do the same mistakes that we have been doing that have created this problem in the first place. So that is just where I wanted to start by following up on that. Now, mitigation. There are some signals that we are going to move more and more towards mitigation, but again, I think the mitigation at this point, well, the new, the new federal administration, they are, they've already reinstituted what's called the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. This yep. is a standard where the federal government says, if we're investing taxpayer money, we want, to be, we want you to build to a higher standard of, uh, that helps avoid flood risk. Um, as good as that is, it's still fairly modest. It has three different methods of uh, determining that, but this was put into place after years of effort during the previous, during the Obama administration. It was eliminated during the Obama administration and Biden put that back into place on his first day in office. So that's one good thing, hopefully trying to stop the hemorrhaging of federal money supporting development in floodplains. Second, the new administration is also talking about dramatic increases for the BRIC program or the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities program, and also the Hazard Mitigation Grant program. I believe, if I remember right, the numbers they're looking at is increasing those programs by six to 10 times as much funding. 
And again, you get into these, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and it sounds like a lot, but when you look at the cost of infrastructure projects and doing some of these things, it doesn't go as far as you might think. So that is, remains a challenge. Um, let's see, so you wanted to ask about mitigation and then you also asked, when do we just simply not build there anymore, right? When do we not build back? Yeah, right. that is literally a question I spoke to someone who, who about four decades ago occupied one of the highest posts in Florida in planning. And person related a story to me that they tried to bring this up 40 years ago. And of course, we're shut down entirely. And the situation really hasn't improved in the last 40 or 50 years for discussing that. Here in Florida, we do discuss the, we're supposed to have post-disaster redevelopment plans. We had that in our statutes for years. And yet local, it was required of local governments to develop these plans. And yet for, for years, most local governments didn't do it. And even today, many still don't have them. And when they do have them, very seldom do they say, you can't rebuild here. Um, what I would argue is if we want to start to try to extric extricate ourselves from this mess, we do have to address the National Flood Insurance pro uh, Program and that rebuilding. And those could very well be linked we're probably gonna to start to need to look at something eventually in the NFIP where we know that a very, very small percentage of the properties in that National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP account for a major portion of the payouts because they have flooded two, five, eight, ten 10 times as Gil demonstrated in his book and that FEMA's own uh, statistics demonstrate. So at one point they were saying that, I think it was, uh, oh, uh, I think it was like 1% of the policies accounted for almost 30% of the payouts over the history of the program. It's just astronomical. And yet we keep allowing these properties to get payouts year after year. That was actually the real genesis of the efforts that began decades ago in the U.S. to start buying out properties. It was to get rid of those specific properties that were hemor hemorrhaging so much money. And I think going forward, we're going to have to start making some sort of decision in a flood insurance program to say, look, once you start getting payouts, after your first payout, you get a notice. We can buy you out right now. If you don't want to take that, that's fine. But you know what? You're now on notice that your future uh, benefits are going to start to decrease. And after a certain point, we're going to kick you out of the program. And that's the end of it. I just don't see any other realistic way for us to keep after this program, we already have forgiven $16 billion in debt to the NFIP. And it remains about 24 to $25 billion in debt today. So it's clearly not a sustainable program from a financial perspective. Thanks. So I, I think so, um, we're gonna come to the NFIP in a minute when we talk more about financing risk. Um, but I wanted to, to hold for a second on mitigation and bring this question from the audience from Renee, um, who has put a couple of comments in to respond to your point, Gil, about um, Dauphin Island. Um, yeah. and, and making the point that we have mixed low income, low educational attainment and, and so on with the vacation homes you've been talking about. So how do we respond to these issues of the, when we make uh, these statements about not being able to build in the place? Well, I, look, I, I think in my view, the larger question for Dolphin Island is whether anything should be there. Now, um, if you, I've, I've been there a lot um, over the last 30 years. I, I became sort of obsessed with the place and I go down there every time after there's a major hurricane because I mean, there's, there's no more dangerous place at the coast in America than Dolphin Island. There is zero elevation. I focus on the West End, which is where all the rental properties are. There's only about 500 of them, but that's where the money comes from for Dauphin Island, um, for the uh, for the revenue stream, for the most part, for, for the government. The middle the middle of the island, um, this the West End has no sand. The middle of the island, bizarrely, has these great sand dunes and a and an 18 hole golf course in the middle of it. It's it's the strangest thing you've ever seen. And then the East End, which is um, a, a beautiful maritime forest and a flyway um, for birds, a migratory flyway, um, used to be erosion proof and used to be fairly stable. Um, and a few years ago, um, it began to erode. So now 
Um, they're not exactly sure why, because the, the geomorphology of Dauphin Island, shaped like a drumstick, is, is pretty odd, pretty strange. You've got a, you also have a major, major uh, ship channel to the left, the Mobile Ship Channel, um, and the Corps of Engineer dredging it in the sand. So you've got a lot of things going on. Nobody can exactly explain why certain parts are sand starved. But the larger question here is whether anybody should be out there these days. Um, I would argue the answer is no. And so we should be helping um, the, the lower income folks that are on still on Dauphin Island um, and just the average folks who are on Dauphin Island uh, look at buyouts. Um, nobody's wanted to sell on Dauphin Island until um, a hurricane about three or four years ago, I forget which one, in which Suddenly, some folks raised the white flag and said, we're willing to sell to FEMA. Uh, I interviewed the mayor. They went through a two-year process of trying to get FEMA to, um, which has very limited buyouts, by the way, uh, to buy those 15 houses. And after, and after two years, they got a letter in the mail saying, sorry, we don't have the money. Buyouts largely, I'm going to answer this question too, because it was up there. They don't work at the coast. And they don't work at the coast for a very simple reason. The value of the property is too high. You can only afford to buy out a, a few places. We had $300 million after Hurricane Sandy here in New Jersey to buy out properties. They went around to the mayors of the 41 or 45 beach towns in New Jersey with the money. They couldn't get a single house to buy. So all that money ended up being used on a couple inland rivers, which had flooding problems, so good. But it wasn't at the coast. And if you look at the number of houses that have been purchased at the coast over the last 50 years, you'll be shocked. And that's a problem because buyouts going forward are going to have to be um, part of the equation. And just as we use elevation now, right? I mean, elevation is a short term fixed. It's great. You know, get you above the water, the waves go underneath you, um, even though your, your pilings get undermined in a serious hurricane. Um, and they'll buy you a couple of decades, but then sea level is going to get you. Your, your house is going to be like Venice, and the only way you're going to be able to get there is by boat. So, I, I want to shift gears a little bit and really get into some of these issues of property rights and the cost of risk. Um, Thomas, like, let's, let's talk about flood maps. Um, and time and time again, uh, we see flooding in places that um, are projected not to flood, places that shouldn't flood, um, according to these maps. Um, increasingly, even inland flooding is becoming more dynamic and more unpredictable, and def definitely flooding along the coast, as we've been discussing. Um, and storms have their own rules. Uh, and so, uh, flood maps still play a critical role in how we plan and how uh, coastal development takes place. I ask, um, do maps actually save us money or lead to wise decision making, um, as some would argue, and is the National Flood Insurance Program still viable? Well, I think the question about the viability I kind of hit on earlier in its current form, no. And I think Congress has recognized that for a long time, but they can't politically figure out how to do it. We'll come back to that. Um, let's see, you also wanted to address, I'm sorry, before the finance, you know, just uh, if we can, let's see, you, your question had two parts there. Sorry, I answered the second part first. <laughs> Maybe, um, maybe for uh, drill down, like how this is one way that we how we use for the maps. Okay, um, yeah, these, uh, I would argue reasons. there are numerous reasons that the maps are at this point in the game. I think the maps are almost on the verge of becoming counterproductive. One, they are so out of date in many instances. I think before Sandy, wasn't a lot of those maps were up to twenty five years out of date. That's right. And let's face it, maps are, they are a modeling exercise. We don't know what happens in any given storm. We have to create these theoretical model storms based on past data we have, and then try to put together, okay, if this type of storm comes, this is what we think will happen. Well, when the map is out of date, what has happened? Well, we know there's been a tremendous amount of growth, which means impermeable surface, concrete buildings, the water doesn't absorb into the ground in those situations now. So you've got a lot more runoff that's going into the rivers. The rivers will get higher. 
So when these maps are dramatically out of date and there's been a lot more development, it can actually be counterproductive because people think they're building in a safe place when they're not. And of course, the maps aren't perfect. No storm is exactly the storm that the maps are created off of. And even beyond all of those technical challenges of trying to keep the maps up to date, which costs inordinate amounts of money, you have just the sheer fact that why are we using a 100 year storm event or the 1% chance storm as it's called. It's a storm that has a 1% chance of occurring according to our data in any given year. That is actually a political construct. It's not really based on any scientific or safety reason. It was simply what the politicians could thought they could get the national flood insurance program passed with back in 1968. The actual floodplain managers that were trying to help design this program back in the 60s, they were arguing for a 500 year flood. Plan. That's exactly right. And of course, the politicians said, look, this isn't going to be politically feasible. We just don't think we can get this through Congress. So they went down to a 100 year flood, uh, 100 year flood as the standard for the floodplain. And if you put that in perspective, everybody talks about we should do what the Dutch do. Well, if we had done what the Dutch were doing back then, we would have used a one in 10,000 year storm event. So that's an actual, I mean, when you start talking one in 10,000 year storm event, you're talking an actual safety standard. What we have isn't even a safety standard, I would argue. So it's no surprise in anybody's book, or it shouldn't be that people flood routinely that are outside of the 100 year flood plain. Gil, I want to come to you and um, we, we've talked about like different scenarios for Florida and, and a lot of people kind of pinpoint the, the turn of the next century. Um, but there's there is a question in there from John earlier about like, how do we bring immediacy to this um, <laughs> conversation and, and think about our own home there, like whether our children are going to graduate from that high school. So um, what maybe you can speak a little bit to that temporal here and where will people go and what are the complications involved um, with people moving and, and also the implications for property value. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're asking a whole lot of questions again. Um, so so the, 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 the short answer is, um, I think, um, looking at this from the standpoint of economics, which is, is kind of my background in training, um, is, is, uh, is, is that property values um, are, are likely to deflate in Florida. And this is going to be a shock to people and the rest of the coast, by the way. This is going to be a shock to people because, as I write in my book, what we have seen at the coast with regard to property values is an inexplicable, um, incredible rate of inflation in property values to the point to the point where the sand that um, even little houses, bungalows um, sit on top of um, are worth is worth five hundred thousand dollars. You know, a tiny little postage stamp size lot. Um, and here's something weird with covid. Um, I, well, let me let me sit back just a second and say that before covid, um, I believed, I still believe this in the long run, this is what's going to happen, is that it's going to be the economics and the finances that eventually drive real change at the coast. It's not going to be the politics. Politicians aren't going to do it. They're just not going to do it. Local politicians and mayors aren't going to do it because their incentive is to get bigger, not smaller. They control land use decisions, um, not states, not counties in most places. And, and um, they're not going to tell somebody whose house gets wrecked in a storm that they can't rebuild. We tried to do that here in New Jersey a long, long time ago, and all hell broke loose. Um, so so that, that's simply not going to happen. I think finances eventually catch up. When the financial institutions, the bankers, the credit rating, rating agencies, whatever we have in the future for flood insurance, when they begin to build real risk into the calculus um, and begin to stop writing 30-year mortgages and maybe go into 15-year mortgages by, say, 2030, 2040, 2050, that begins to, to make people more aware of the choices that they are making and the actual risks involved in those choices. 
I think at that point, you possibly begin to see some change. But there is a potential for property values to just get crushed in all of this going forward. Um, the chief economist, I think it was at um, either Freddie or Fannie back in uh, about a decade ago now, or maybe it was 2012 or so thereabouts, wrote a wrote a paper in which he said it, it um, you know, the damage could be as 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 bad as the collapse, the financial collapse in 2008. So that gives you an idea of what we're staring at. I mean, we have we have created a situation that um, it's going to be incredibly expensive, and it's it's going to be not just governments; it's going to be individual property owners. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Gil. I want to um, come to you, Thomas. And a question came in from Jenison, um, who was asking about possible incentives or levers, and um, political will to prompt change in this kind of development um, process that we see playing out on the coast? I, you know, unfortunately, I, I agree with Gil, unfortunately. I think it, I just think politically, we are never going to make the hard decisions to change the basics of our behavior that are, that are creating this problem. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think that the I think that the political and economic incentives at the local level are too strong. If I'm a local government and somebody buys up one of these, you know, half million dollar coastal bits of sand that Gil referred to, and then they come to me and they want a permit, I've got all these maps and data showing all the problems this is going to create, it's going to be flooding. I'm not going to be able to create any infrastructure to service that property. There's going to be significant risk. And, oh, and, you know, I'm looking at that and I don't want to necessarily maybe give that permit. But what, what then is going to happen if I don't issue the permit, I'm probably going to get sued for under property rights taking law. And they're going to claim a taking of their private property right to use their property as they want. And even if I don't lose that as the local government, it's still going to cost me money. And if I'm a small local government, I'm really, really risk averse to those lawsuits because even if I don't lose, they cost me a lot. So I don't want that. And then if I do give the permit, what's going to happen? Okay, now I've drawn out, I'll, I'll increase my tax revenue because the property tax value will go up on that parcel. And Worst case scenario, yes, we get hit by a big storm and the infrastructure servicing that property is wiped out. I have to rebuild it at great public expense. Oh, but then I turn around and I give the bill to the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, aka the federal taxpayer. And they will pay 80, probably at least 80%, if not maybe a 100% of the cost of rebuilding that infrastructure for me. So I get the benefit of increased tax revenue. I avoid the potential of a lawsuit in the short term. Um, it's just the, the incentives are not that. Oh, and plus, politically at the local level, if I start trying to shut down and development, that's why I started this whole conversation with the lifeblood of Florida's its history of development and growth. I'm, I'm anti-Floridian almost if I try to shut down growth as a local, as a local government official. I mean, that is not something we do easily here. So I just think that, yes, it's going to have to be the economics of it that change it. But I think that change, many of us recognize, is probably going to come like falling off the edge of a cliff. It will not be a slow, um, gentle, humane, reasonable adjustment. It will be the bursting of a bubble. Because... All of us that work in this area understand there are all these different interrelated parts of the economic system. It's the bond rating market, it's the property values, it's the insurance industry. You know, there are all these different things that are the more the mortgage banking industry. Any one of those, if it re starts to really take into take this into account seriously and be impacted by the realities that we see on the ground then it's going to affect all the others. And it's, and then it becomes just like a run in the stock market. As soon as some people start to sell off, everybody looks, oh my gosh, they're selling off and then it's going to all fall apart. That's what we all fear is going to happen. Um, but I just don't think this is something where we're going to be able to make hard enough political decisions. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that, just culturally and humanly. A lot of it is 
goes back to our biases in cognition. There's a great book uh, by some uh, great book called the, o the Ostrich Paradox, why we underprepare for disasters. And they actually outlined several, I think, let's see, I've got a list here of the six different cognitive biases that they discuss that are what contribute to why we don't make better decisions. And they talk about myopia or how we just look at the short term. Uh, amnesia, how we forget the things in the past. Optimism bias, how we always think that, yeah, things are going to get bad, but you know what? It's not as bad. It won't be as bad here. Um, inertia, well, we're just going to keep doing things the way we have. Simplification, oh, it's just too complicated. The easier way to think about it is that, you know, we'll just build our way out of it. And then the herding instinct. And of course, that still comes into play today. You know, well, of course, why wouldn't it be fine to buy a house here on the coast? Look at all the other houses are, that are along here on the coast. So, I mean, we have these cognitive biases that prevent us, I think, as individuals from being able to kind of fully grasp the enormity of something this big. So I'd really love to, to follow that thread um, and sort of ask a question about the system and the government, the governance structure that we have. Um, and, and Gil, maybe you can shed some light on this. So it seems like from this conversation, um, from all of the work that both of you have discussed is local policymakers who have a set of constraints and a set of pressures and incentives uh, that deal with risk. At the state and definitely the federal level, there's also its own kinds of pressures and incentive structures. Um, and that's where the, the big dollars are coming from for, for risk or hazard mitigation projects. So I don't, are any coastal communities actually aligned and doing things well? Uh, or what, what is politically, what does the path forward look like? Um, so everyone is kind of in a position to make good decisions uh, regarding these issues. You know, I've inter interviewed scores and scores of, of uh, beach town mayors and mayors of coastal communities along the bays and estuaries over, over the years. Um, you know, most of them are really smart people. Um, they understand what the risks are. Um, but I don't know how else to put this. Money drives um, all the decisions. Yeah, they're afraid of being sued, property rights taking cases, which has happened. I mean, we all know we're familiar with the big ones. Um, they, uh, many of them uh, are in the real estate and development industry themselves at the coast. Uh, if you go in, you know, I've, I've done this in certain towns and just look at who's on the land use board. Um, who's the mayor? Who are who are the town council members? How do they make their money? Well, they live in these towns, and the way you make money um, if you live in in a beach community is through development, through property. Um, you know, a few lawyers, few accountants, so on. But but the real money is in development. So all of the economic incentives point that way. Um, at the state level, um, states are real good at producing reports. Uh, that end up going on shelves. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are nothing more than cut and paste. Um, sometime I encourage you, if you haven't done already, to read hazard mitigation reports done at the state levels and the county levels. Some of them are really good, and some of them are embarrassingly bad. And at the county level, they tend to be, for the most part, pretty bad. And then finally, you have the federal government. And as somebody once explained to me, um, if you're a coastal state lawmaker, you don't win any votes by suggesting that maybe it's a bad idea to build on an eroding barrier island. <laughs> I mean, you just don't. Um, so uh, it's it's one hurricane after another. You go into the politics and you look at the politics of how the money gets steered. Um, it's the coastal, coastal legislators calling in favors. Um, and everybody feels badly when you look at a knockdown house or somebody's lost the house. Um, and, the, and the media feeds this, by the way, it covers hurricanes and disasters. Um, we never get to asking the hard questions. Um, they, they push for money and often 
cases, oftentimes um, they actually are able to get the federal government to pay more than what the federal government um, by law um, is supposed to pay. So instead of paying, say, 75 percent for the public assistance program to rebuild roads, roads or, or water systems or whatever, um, they end up paying 100 um, percent. It's it's a really tough nut to crack. It really is, which is why I keep coming back to saying it's not going to be politics that change this. It's going to be it's going to be intersection of climate change, these big storms, the sea level rise, um, and the financial people finally waking up and building that into their risk calculus. Yeah, those are good points. And if I could just jump in to build on that, Jason. Um, there are some communities I think that are trying to do things that are that are good. Um, I know I'm working with one community called Satellite Beach on Florida's east coast, and it's a you know about ten thousand people on a piece of sand on a barrier island. So they really don't have any place to move to, and that's true of many many coastal communities in Florida. There really isn't a viable place to move their community to because it's all too low. And I think they're doing what they can politically and what's realistic, but I think they're doing it quite well. They're looking, they're moving towards policies that are making clear to people, these are the finance, these are the, these are the scientific realities of where we're headed, the physical and scientific realities. These are the economic constraints we face. And so what we're, we are telling you from right now going forward is, there is infrastructure that we're not going to be able to maintain. There are places we are not going to be able to save. And we are going to orient ourselves to doing what we can to try to make this a safe, good place to live as long as we can. And are they actually doing some density intensification? Yes, they are, because they are sensitive to the fact they do need a tax base. But at the same time, they are kind of trying to put people on notice that we are not going to continue, be able to continue business as usual in this community. And so I think that's, uh, it's, you know, it's small relative to the size of the challenge in front of us. But if we can take the time, if we can take the money that we're going to use and use it to buy time, because again, that's all we can do is buy time in many of these places, because there is not no solution over the, you know, very long term. But if we can use the time that we buy through adaptations to try to work towards the idea of better relocation, I know there was a question about that that we haven't really gotten to yet. Um, but that's really where we need to be moving. And I think it's interesting that in, this, in the United States, all the talk around relocation so far is mostly focused on buyout. And what we failed to do, appreciate, I think, is there is a whole international literature that's decades old around um, displacement and relocation. And it's occurred very much in other countries uh, through major infrastructure development like dams has been one of the main drivers of the literature on displacement and relocation. And that is something that we should be tapping into far more to try to understand how do you help the most under-resourced communities. Because I think one of the great fears that we that I really have is that sea level rise and adaptation is just going to be another thing like development of the interstate road system. We will use it and we will specifically hurt certain segments of our society and others will make great amounts of money off of it. And it could become yet another step on the road <clears throat> towards ever greater inequality that we've been marching towards for decades now. And that, to me, is, I think, my greatest fear about poor adaptation. Thanks so much, Thomas. And I think you've, you've really spoken to um, some ideas, maybe, for people who are, who are looking at this and thinking, how can I make better decisions in my position as a professional or as a researcher? Um, and so, Gil, we need to wrap this up, but I want to come to you and just ask if you have any closing thoughts for, for people tuning in here thinking about how they can apply some of this knowledge into their um, into their work. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, are you talking about researchers? Are you talking about local um, each town officials? I think we probably have a mix of both in this in on this stream. So um, but I would say right. most for people making decisions about about um, 
that has an impact on development. Right. So, I, I mean, the good news is I think there's tons of data out there um, that's read, readily accessible from property records to the FEMA database for the NFIP, which is somewhat more open than it used to be, um, to the hazard mitigation uh, grant planning. Um, there's really a lot of good data. I used all this data over years. And, you know, like any good analyst, you take it, you put it into spreadsheets, you analyze it. Does it tell me a story about something, a trend? It's all in the data. So it's not like this is a secret. So that's the good news. It's more the political will, which I think Thomas has eloquently described the dilemma there, um, whether um, we can somehow figure out, figure out a way to get past um, some of the uh, some of the. Uh, uh, local issues, the economics. Um, I, I'd like to say that I, I'd like to think that the states can play a much more aggressive role here. Um, they have tried in the past and they've gotten beaten down. It just hasn't gotten anywhere. But I think maybe going forward that could change. That in turn is going to depend on whatever becomes of our current state of affairs with politics, because at the moment it's not going anywhere. Um, so we're not going to have these conversations. Um, we'll have these conversations in silos instead of in a large open forum the way we need to have these conversations. Um, the federal government can do more. Again, it, it depends on the politics. I mean, I think the people in FEMA, a lot of the people in FEMA, even a lot of the people in the NFIP are really good people. They're, they want to do the right thing. They try to do the right thing, and then they run into the politics, and they often get beaten down. So maybe under Joe Biden, um, you know, that'll change, and we'll, we'll see an opportunity. I think there are lots of opportunities for both Republicans and Democrats to fix uh, flood insurance. And when I say fix, it may mean ending it. So let's be clear about that. Um, but there's chances to do things there. There are chances to do better things in the short run, like, as Thomas is talking about, especially with the hazard mitigation grant program, which is where we're, really the serious money is. And then there's money buried within HUD that a lot of people don't know about that goes to disasters that we could refocus um, and, do, and do some good things. I'm actually cautiously optimistic about the back bays and the estuaries. We haven't talked a lot about that, but it, it, it's going to be, I think, in quotations, easier to wrestle with some of the issues back there if we can somehow find the discipline to stop developing um, recklessly along those waterways. And I think that because the property values there are lower than they are at the immediate coast on the ocean front, there's a chance to do more relocations, more buyouts there. Um, equity issues, the people along those places, especially in states like North Carolina and South Carolina, tend to be fairly poor. Um, you know, we can help those folks. We can focus on their issues first. Um, and help them and get them out of harm's way. So it's not, even though I've painted a pretty bleak picture, I mean, I think there's things that can be done uh, in the short run to uh, to uh, to help ourselves. Great. Yeah, and if I could just add, is there time to add one last comment? Okay, go for it. I, I mean, just to kind of build on that, I, I also don't want to leave it all on the doom and gloom. And there have been some comments about help about helping people relocate and where are they going to go. And I think for Florida, since Florida is about growth and development, I don't think we're going to be able to change that. So maybe what we need to try to do here in Florida is try to work with that sentiment and use that to try to go to our interior areas and develop better than we have in the past, do something other than energy inefficient land gobbling sprawl development and create more human scale and intensive and public transit friendly development that can actually serve as the place for people to go as they relocate. Um, I think that's one of the only ways, because if we don't try to find a way to make this a revenue generator for somebody, if it's only gonna be losses, it's we're gonna wait until the last moment until it is catastrophic. So if we can buy time, try to start making moves in the right direction to buy ourselves time through adaptation at the coast, and promote better development and help to find better places for people to live. That might be one option here in Florida. Thank you. And I, I want to thank uh, 
both of our amazing guests today, uh, Thomas Rupert and Gilbert Call. Um, I also want to thank the Florida Climate Institute for organizing this event, Florida Sea Grant, and the UF Office of Sustainability. Tune in next week um, at the same time, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, for another enriching conversation. Um, next week will be about uh, local government and financing and uh, some of these challenges with uh, hazard disaster resilience. And I just want to thank, thank you all for your contributions in the comments. And we will see you all later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.